Bring back to England. And I'll just show you a couple because they they really key in very strongly to what will become the kind of the kind of leading themes of Victorian art through the next generation, which are genre subjects, usually with some kind of um, double entente. So this one is called Prayer, and we see a very, very poor, we can see her dress is all torn here. Um, girl sitting, a Spanish girl, lovely dark eyes and hair, sitting at the door of a church while a woman with her mantilla and I think a wedding ring um, is inside the door. So all your sympathies are with this poor, poor woman. And a painting like that would be engraved and the engraving would be sold in multiples. Another painting by John Philip, the same very emotional, here comes the, the loyal wife bringing the baby to be kissed while the mother entertains the god. Um, now, I can't see my captioning because there's a block sitting right in front of it, but never mind, I hope you can see it. So Thomas Oldham Barlow was um, a very, very good mezzotinter. I'm just trying to give you a sense of the sort of flavour of the culture at the time. Now, David Roberts' epic journey to record drawings and watercolours for the, this great portfolio that was called the Holy Land, Syria, Idumea, Arabia, sorry, Arabia, Egypt and Nubia, they were tinted lithographs and it was published there in the 1840s. In 1838, he embarked on an 11 month groundbreaking tour. He left London in August and a month later disembarked in Alexandria. He then moved to Cairo and he chartered a boat to take him up the Nile. Now this is no mean feat, we think nothing of going anywhere in the world. We might think going to Mars a bit adventurous, but quite frankly, anything else is doable. But really, it was extremely intrepid. First of all, likelihood of getting ill, likelihood of not coming back. Um, nobody had done it before. And, and to, well, I mean, explorers had done it from the other end, but going up there as an artist, no cameras, you had to draw everything and you had to save your drawings. So he was the very first British artist to undertake the journey, and he marvelled at the ancient sites of Abu Simbel, Philae, Dendera, Laksu and Karnak, and they were still buried in the sand. Um, let's do, just look at a British Museum map to get the idea. You can see how large the delta is, vast. Cairo with Giza, Saqqara, and as you come up here, Laksu, Karnak, Dendera right there, the Valley of the Kings, and the right on up to Aswan, Philae, and Abu Simbel. So that took him a long time and he made very, very many drawings and watercolours. Um, I was quite moved, in fact, by these words of John Ruskin. He said, these hundred drawings were the first studies ever made consciously by an English painter not to exhibit his own skill, but to give true portraiture of scenes of historical and religious interest. Isn't that nice? He was not a great ego. He was not flamboyant. He was, he'd been brought up very tough and to be diligent and to work. And that's what he did. So now let's just look at some of the work that he did. This, of course, is a very austere topographical um, drawing of the, of the Sphinx with the pyramids behind. And as I looked at it, what struck me was the absolute absence of any form of development. It's quite amazing to think that in the thousands of years since these monuments were made, nothing at all has developed. I mean, apart from the fact there's not a leaf or a tree, there are no houses, no sheds, no shacks, no roads, no city, nothing. They're simply there. Now, he always puts in a little bit of life just to give you the sense of the scale of the monuments. And we're going to notice that here's some people up here as we look at his work. So this is a straightforward topographical interpretation. But with this one, he introduces a more romantic view. And um, we can see that a storm is brewing, sandstorm is coming, um, the sun is going down, there are clouds gathering, and people are obviously shouting. And he's beginning to imbue the work with romanticism. 
But you know that um, he is not really the first to open up Egypt because that really goes to the Napoleon. Napoleon sitting here looking chubby and rather cross by Paul de la Roche. Napoleon um, had his Egyptian campaign, so it lasted about three years. And it was very, very important, as I mentioned in a second. It was a military campaign, but in addition to the military campaign, he took something like 150 scholars from various fields. They were botanists, um, architects, ar archaeologists, engineers, all kinds of people to record what he could find of the culture of ancient Egypt. Now, the military camp, I'll just show you another one. This is a portrait of Napoleon by Jean-Léon Jérôme. And let's remember that Jérôme's patron was the nephew of Napoleon. So obviously, Jérôme was going to romanticize and make Napoleon at least six foot six with gaunt, glamorous, romantic features, rather than the tubby chap we just seen. Actually, the doctor that performed the autopsy when um, Napoleon died measured the body at five foot two inches French measurements, possibly five foot six English measurements. Just that's a little aside. I do like trivial knowledge. I really collect trivia. So the thing was that he went down with 55,000 soldiers and 400 ships. He really did it properly and he did defeat Egypt very easily. But the, the, that his project, his agenda, was to cut England off from India and to block the, the route to India. And that was, would have been absolutely disastrous for, for England. Well, thanks to Admiral Lord Horatio Nelson, the French fleet was destroyed at the Battle of the Nile almost completely with the help of a few Ottoman ships. But Lord Nelson uh, had the victory. And in the... Um, in the surrender terms, some clever little subaltern, perhaps on one of the ships, said, why don't we include that stone they found? You know, that stone they found down at, what's that place? Rosetta. Why don't we include that stone? Really? Well, OK. Anyway, of course, it's one of the most important things ever found because it has three languages. And if you can read both these two, which Champollion could do, he could read the third. And it's said that at the moment he does sigh with the hieroglyphs, he collapsed and passed out. But he also had a very serious neurological illness, which got worse and worse. He spent a frantic year going around deciphering as much as he possibly could. And back to France, very ill, very, very young, only 39, 40. Um, he developed, he became locked in, he developed total paralysis. And it's quite ironic that he gave a voice to an entire civilization but he couldn't speak himself. Towards the end, he lost the ability to speak. So that is a great, great scholar who tragically died very young. But it wasn't only artifacts that were sent back to, to Paris. It wasn't only um, Egypt, you know, ancient Egypt. It was also animals, because animals expressed the exotic sense of a land that nobody traveled to. And I particularly love Zarafa. She was a very pretty girl giraffe, as you can see. And she came right down the Blue Nile and then down the White Nile and crossed the Mediterranean, went up the Rhone with every mare competing to welcome her with umpa bands. She arrives in Paris and is given to the king. The point was to express the reach of the French king and the English king. Well, Zarafa apparently is Turkish for giraffe. I just learned that from one of my students recently. So it was this whole fascination with lands that you couldn't visit. And so David Roberts then makes these very, very accurate topographical drawings. Um, and wonderful. I mean, I like them because exactly as Ruskin says, that there's no side to them. There's no um, message. They just are what they are. You get to see what you want to see, just as if you were there with the camera. Um, this one he's showing much more painting. I don't know if the painting actually survived or if he's exaggerated it, he possibly did. This is the portico of the temple of um, at Philae. Now, uh, another one, Dendera, as I mentioned, almost modern because it's 54 BC, so it's Ptolemaic. Um, 
again, the sand blowing up and blowing up every year. Um, it's much more elaborate looking. But I like the fact that he's put in groups of people. And there's always a sense of lassitude, as if there's no sense of Protestant work ethic or anything that has to be done. You know, you have the sense that you sit around with your hookah and your drinks being offered, probably by a black slave here, and then girls playing tambourines and uh, sort of guitars or lutes. And it's all rather pleasant and relaxed. Um, and that's the kind of atmosphere that, that, that is created. Now, this one are these absolutely stupendous, great, enormous colossi. Goodness knows how they got in there and, and had them upright, but they have been standing there since 1350 BC. And you see the light sinking behind them in this beautiful, beautiful drawing of watercolour. It's, of course, a tinted lithograph by the time we get to see it. Amazing colossi, amazing belief in the future, don't you think? Um, going up to Edfa, the sand again, you can see up here this winged, can you see this slight winged thing? They're, they're up here as well, you can see these winged. So you see that on the outside of tombs, um, the winged figure that takes the soul up. Apparently there were seven aspects to the Egyptian soul. But again, the same thing, you, the sand going up and up and the sort of temptation to dig the sand away. Now, Philae was obviously an immensely rich cult center. I mean, massively rich, because this was the center of the worship of Isis and Osiris, and it was one of the burial places of Osiris. Um, well, I say one of the burial places, you're probably going to be a bit confused. How can you be buried in more than one place? Well, I think if you're a god, you might be able to be. And of course, Osiris was torn to bits. So maybe the different bits were buried in different parts. Um, but of course, Osiris comes back to life. He's one of the first examples of, of resurrected God. But you can see this tremendous uh, center here and how it must have looked and how wealthy it must have been. So that's a very good drawing. And then right up to above the Aswan Dam. And because this was so far and so remote, um, that David Roberts chose this this one to be on the frontispiece of his great folio that he was going to print and sell when he got back to England. Always a few tiny people just to give you some scale of the purely massive scale. So he comes back to Cairo and it's Wednesday, January the 2nd, and he has a visit from Mr. Warren, the consul, and Mr. Perring, who informed me that in order to visit the various mosques, let alone make drawings, I must assume the Turkish dress. I've therefore purchased a suit today and tomorrow. I must divest myself of my whiskers. This is too bad, but I've taken too long a journey to stand now about trifles. I think after all, I shall be about the first professional man who sat down to make a drawing and we shall see how I get on. Well, Saturday is the appointed time for visiting, and I've tried on my dress, which suits me capitally, but my servant informs me I become the dress very well. But he's such a thorough rogue that I can believe him in nothing. I do like that little exchange, it was quite sweet. So now the great thing is here he is in his wonderful robes, and the painting is made almost immediately after he gets back from his great journey. And this has to be one of the most romantic and most beautiful portraits of the period that I know. And you see him here transformed to a tall, elegant aristocrat with a slight contrapposter swing of the hips, a distant, misty look in his eyes, tall, elegant neck, um, great turban on his head, a nobility, graciousness. And you see him as you look up to him because you are below him, you look up towards him. And the astounding use of color, the, exactly the right amount of crimson, where's my pointer? Exactly the right amount of crimson, setting off the misty heights of crags, you know, Sinai, Petra, all the places he visited are kind of hinted in this background here. 
And it's just the most, most wonderful romantic portrait. And of course, he has his sword. That isn't quite how he looked. And I'm going to show you that this is really how he looked. So he literally had no neck and his double chin, quite stubby looking little nose. And here he is. Um, you can see he was quite a small man. But what does that matter? Somehow it captures his spirit. And it was very fashionable to dress up in Islamic robes, in Oriental robes, Ottoman, let's call them. Let's get the right term. And it was very fashionable. So the most fashionable one, of course, is Byron. And here is Byron in his Albanian dress, painted by Thomas Phillips, a, pa a painting that you will all probably know rather well. But you may not know this one by Robert Wilson, or rather of Robert Wilson, who was another Scot. It's interesting they were all Scots from Banff in Northern Scotland. And he was a surgeon in the East India Company. And you can see him painted with Athens in the background and scrolls. You can see that he's, you know, he's, he's letting us know he's an educated man. He's probably been on the grand tour and he's been as far as Greece. Now, very few people went as far as Greece because you had to go across the water. Most of them just went down to Naples. Um, and this is the whole portrait just to show you the green velvet um, how it sets off the burnt orange velvet and just the, the you know, the sort of sensuous mouth. And there's Byron with storm clouds and well, there may be storm clouds behind him. Um, one of the others who dressed in Turkish Ottoman dress was Edward Lane. We see him here um, painted by James, uh, James Lane, I think was his brother. And this man was one of these great Arabists. Now, now, the English of a certain type and background were absolutely obsessed with the Arabic land language and with the Arabic culture. Um, and he was a great Arabist. In fact, he translated the Arabian Nights and um, he had translated some of the Quran as well. But he lived in Cairo and he did lots of drawings in the back streets of Cairo. But you can see a very, very, very English profile there, wearing very nobly wearing the Turkish dress. But the most dangerous of all was quite definitely Sir Richard Burton. So Richard Burton was so terrifyingly clever that he got kicked out of everything. I think he was sacked from Trinity, uh, Trinity Cambridge. He was such a, he, he knew, it's thought that he knew about 27 languages at least. He knew seven Indian languages and he translated the Kama Sutra and unleashed it on an unsuspecting British public. Can you imagine how that went down? Um, he also translated A Thousand Nights and One, as he called it, and the Quran. And his Arabic was so good that he also knew slang Arabic. Um, in fact, when he took his exams, and I think they were for the East India Company, uh, they asked about three people to invigilate the exam. Everybody said no, because they knew there'd be a huge row if something went wrong. He had a terrible reputation. Um, and in the end, there was nobody to examine him, so they failed him. But he's the greatest linguist and the greatest Arabist of all. Um, he knew African languages. There was, he even kept a menagerie of monkeys, because he was certain that monkeys probably could talk, and he identified about 60 words. Um, he got into all kinds of fights and wars. He was he met um, a Mongolian javelin, which went right through his his head, his face, and he escaped the battle with the javelin still in his head. As you can see some of the scarring. He discovered the source of the Blue Nile. He discovered Lake Victoria. He discovered Lake Tanganyika. That is Richard Burton. So and of course, he's the first man to go on the Hajj and to go to Mecca. In fact, he had to have himself circumcised to do it. So, the, so these are the sort of people you can see the obsession and the interest. And David Roberts was right there with exactly what people wanted, which was to see the places that they couldn't possibly go to for cultural reasons and because they were just too difficult to get to, too far away. So here is David Roberts dressed in his robes, um, drawing the inside of a mosque, making the mosque probably much higher than it really was and somehow calling on his training as a painter of scenery in the theatres. It's a wonderful tinted lithograph. Um, he's very, very faithful to the detail of the architecture. Another absolutely breathtaking scene 
of a mosque. And you see the sky up here that they were, I didn't realize that they were open to the sky so rain could come down. And then the kind of rain of chains with, with the lamps hanging low, really wonderful drawing, I think. And so different from the enclosed spaces of English churches. Um, so, in, so entirely different. Another another mask again. I can't see my captioning, but I hope you can. If I move this, I think it might just upset things. So we'll just have to ignore it. Um, another one with 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 daylight here. It reminds me rather of a Roman impluvium where the rain came down into the atrium of the house. Um, a very a very very sophisticated and developed mask that's now a church has been a church for centuries in Spain. Now, he also paints what he sees of ordinary life, but he paints it without comment. He paints it without judgment. There's no finger pointing. There's no, he's not making any capital out of it. He's not milking the situation to sell the product. He simply shows us slaves in the slave market. And these are all African slaves. Here are the slave dealers. And up here, maybe this is kind of a lead slave who's trying to bargain, I don't know. I did have to do rather a lot of research on this. And I found that nearly 10 million Africans were shipped out as slaves by on the Islamic slave trade up to Arabia and some of them to the Indian subcontinent. And they were almost all women and girls, almost all women and girls. And they were taken for concubinage, sex, that was there. But the children that they bore, because of course they, they got pregnant, the children were born were half African, but free because the fathers were Muslim. So the children were born free and half African, which you need to think about. If you think of the origins of the people of the Middle East, that for centuries, this was, 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 was happening. Of course, the males, they did take some male slaves. Uh, they had to walk, of course, to get out of Africa, and they were castrated on arrival, and only 10% only survived the castration. It was so brutal, 90% died. So that is a little thing. And of course, the slavery got what well, the slavery reached a peak in the 19th century with thousands and thousands every year. As you see, I've written it down there. But now when you see the French Orientalists, they milk the whole situation. Um, and here is the two paintings, both by, by Jérôme. He really loved slavery. I mean, he painted slavery in lots of contexts. And here you see the indignity of this girl being stripped naked, and having her teeth examined in the slave market and, you know, the horror of it. But nevertheless, he does put it into a rather nice contrapposto. You know, he's a classical painter after all, and we can see um, a Greek goddess tucked away there somewhere. I'm sorry I'm so um, cynical about it, but you have to have very open eyes when you look at the, art, the history of art. Uh, these two, this one's by Horace Vernet, also a friend. You're supposed to have a terrible indrawing of breath, as you see this very beautiful Caucasian slave here and the Nubian slave dealer. And these ones here, again, Jérôme, a very tragic group of pathetic people. So tugging at the heartstrings. Um, I just wanted to show you, I think I have one other, to show you the kind of Orientalist approach on the continent. This one to sort of suggest that slaves, it wasn't all that bad after all. Some of the slaves had quite a fun time. This one's being offered some um, new pearls. I'm just, I'm just showing you how very different it was. So after two more months back in Cairo, David Roberts goes off to the desert with 15 Bedouin and 21 camels and two fellow Scots. They dress in local Turkish or Arabic dress in order to be in disguise and for safety, of course. And then in February, they reach the Red Sea. And I think that's a beautiful watercolor. And the, you know that the white town sort of floats in the water, in the shallow water. I think maybe somebody put a coffee cup down here. I don't really think that's meant to be a rainbow. But in any case, this gives you the feeling of the heat and the, the openness of it all. And he, he crosses now over and he goes on up. So he goes up the Sinai Desert to Petra, 
Hebron and to Jerusalem. He goes to Bethlehem and the Dead Sea. And all of these places appear in the great portfolio that he prints when he gets back. Um, and Vict Queen Victoria becomes the very first subscriber. Well, you can't, don't get better than that. Um, some of the lithographs are absolutely extraordinary in terms of technique. You know that it is the depth of the acid eating into the stone that gives the amount of, of um, ink that settles on the stone and the tone. And look at the different depths, look at the different tonal variations and the, the water like milk pouring over. Absolutely incredibly talented. And this is Louis Haig, the Belgian lithogra lithographer. Petra, he shows as tremendously dramatic. I don't remember it being quite so high, but remember he's a theatrical designer, so that's always in the back of our minds. And the great temple that you see as you come through the Sikh, you see the light falling on the temple. Now, in reality, it's much more enclosed and you come out of the, you walk through this long, dark crack in the mountain and your eyes are accustomed to the dark and suddenly you see this blinding temple right in front of you. So it doesn't quite look like that. Another one, and always the figures in the foreground. Now, the, this is one of the tinted lithographs, again, the incredible skill of Louis Haig, um, showing people at prayer, Dome of the Rock in the distance, and beautiful clarity, and sort of absolute clarity of it. It's really extraordinary. A lot of the works that he did around Jerusalem are more around the landscape, and I don't remember Jerusalem being so very hilly, but a lot of you will have, I know quite a few of my friends who may be here today will have been there. But he seems to show it as very hilly. Um, and this is the road to Bethany. Um, this is beginning to look a lot more like Turner, you know, with the, with the, with the palm tree sort of blowing in the wind as a sort of repoussoir in the front of the painting. So you can see that he is still quite close to Turner. He takes us inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which for anybody in England, in the, you know, at the, at the height of a great Christian revival would have been absolutely thrilled to see the inside of the Holy Sepulchre Church. And just a landscape of Jerusalem. I'm going to show you now a few of the paintings that he made when he got back to England, where he really became a superlative painter. He goes up to Baalbek, and he, um, it's, it's raining very heavily and he gets a chill, he gets ill, and he, um, he goes off to seek refuge in a nearby Greek monastery. Um, and he gets well, of course, you know, he's a tough chap and he, and he survives. And um, he said, I've begun my studies of the temple, of the magnificence of which it's impossible to convey any idea either by pencil or pen. The beauty of the form, the exquisite richness of its ornament and the vast magnitude and dimensions are altogether unparalleled. And I remember that, that this is exactly the experience I had when I went to Baalbek. I mean, it was much, much more impressive than this watercolor because the columns are absolutely incredibly high. Here they are. And remember, it's a Roman, it's a Roman sanctuary. So it's all Roman. And here again, he has the figures in the foreground that seem to be relaxed as if he got absolutely nothing to do all day. Um, that is one of the things that the, that the, criti the critics of Orientalism pick up on. They say that there was a deliberate narrative to try and portray the world like that, the Islamic world. But I don't think, I don't agree with that. I think, you know, Roberts just painted exactly what he, what he saw. He saw people sitting around. Um, so this is just a map to show you the, uh, I just want to show you how very, very big the, 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 the sanctuary was with all these Roman temples. And back now in, in England, he, uh, he actually becomes a Royal Academician. I'm going to show you his work in a minute. But these wonderful painting, the contrast of the warm browns and the pale blue, exactly the right blues and browns, the simplicity of the composition, these great big columns with the tiny figure, uh, I think channeling Veronese, um, that sort of thing, you know, very high Renaissance going on into the 18th century. 
And, and this one too, another very, very large painting. Again, beautifully composed with the diagonals coming down, sort of answering the diagonal of light that swoops down here. Another diagonal for good measure down here. So a zigzag composition going up through the clouds. Beautiful quality of tone. Again, everything he's learnt, the tiny figures giving the massive scale of the buildings. And this was his diploma work, and I wouldn't have been walking through that door myself. Uh, so the great, great gate of, um, of the Baalbek temple as his great diploma work. It must have stopped people in their tracks. And then this one, the entrance to the old city of Cairo. Again, he's absolutely mastered the art of receding tone, which he didn't do at the beginning, if you remember the first work I showed you. It's exotic. There are camels, there are traders, there is noise, there are, there are markets and souks, there are foreigners. It's exciting, it's wonderful. And I find it particularly moving because my grandparents lived in Heliopolis. My mother and my aunt and uncle were tiny children in Cairo and they would have been in the walled city going to the markets and my mother, in fact, knew Arab, some Arabic. So it's, it's quite wonderful to imagine that she would have been in this place like that. So here is this wonderful, wonderful friend, not only friend, but superlative lithographer. It is really his work that enabled these drawings, these unique drawings, to be turned into multiples of prints and sold probably very expensively in portfolios to the queen first and then those below her. Now, the strange thing is, his right hand was paralyzed from birth and he still managed to do it. When he died, he was actually buried right next to David Roberts. And David Roberts sort of person that you want as a friend. He was always there, he was solid, he was loyal to his friends and people liked him. He would never have risen to great heights in anything had he not been absolutely likable and reliable. And the queen, I mean, the queen supported him and encouraged him as she did very many other Victorian Victorian um, artists. And if I can just tell you, as we're here, what I'm going to do in January, I'm very interested in what we're doing right now. And I'm going to look at the, I, I'm going to look at the huge influence that Victoria had on the art of the 19th century and how her own beliefs and faiths, as it were, are kind of, kind of steered, steered uh, the direction of art. And of course, his great championing of animals and so on. So that's what we're going to look at, the art of empire in January. Um, this one here is John Frederick Lewis, who I'm just showing you because he is slightly the next generation. He lives in Cairo for about 10 years and also dresses up in Turkish dress. So now we've seen that. Let's see some of what John Frederick Lewis does. He doesn't show sex and orgies. He doesn't show slaves and Nubian slaves. He's not really interested in milking the culture. What he wants is to show the atmosphere, the clothes, the sort of the markets, the stairways. And here's a trader sitting by his wares. And he may well be selling a Chinese pot that might have come from China because there's a great deal of Chinese porcelain passing through Cairo and of course Persian rugs. And here again, with the swords in his belt, I just have to tell you that they are both portraits of himself. So he did in fact rather fake up these paintings. So he lived in Cairo for 10 years with his wife. He never painted a nude in his life. I mean, this is the kind of English Orientalist. It's all about the atmosphere, the clothes, the markets, um, rather than the um, continental view. When he came back to England, he settled in Walton on Thames. And I'll just go back to that in a minute. He settled in Walton on Thames and he paints a harem in Cairo, which is probably actually in Walton on Thames, England. Um, but you see all the mushroom work here and, uh, you know, the clothes and that, but everybody fully dressed, it's all totally respectable. This one here is beautiful. It's in the Tate. And you can, I see the influence. Well, it certainly takes me to the Odalisques of Matisse. Um, and what you see through the window then is not Cairo at all, but Walton on Thames. Just to go back a minute, 
to the one I had skipped past. This watercolour, which is in Yale, the Yale Centre for British Art, which is where it absolutely should be, is probably kind of a faked painting, because I don't think uh, Frederick Lewis, he lived in Cairo, he never went to Sinai, but it's, it's a kind of constructed painting. And here you see the young British tourist lordling uh, with his lovely, is it black and white collie dog or spaniel, his book of poetry, he's reading his Ovid or something. And, you know, he's a sort of Nubian slave making his tea. You wouldn't have him at home, of course. And he doesn't even bother to get up when a tribesman bristling with, with knives stands before him. And, you know, the sense of arrogance and contempt or disinterest or lack of fear is, is coming, is, is in this. And that is the sort of thing that annoyed the critics of Orientalism. But as I said, this is entirely faked up because he wasn't there. So, um, on, no, de Hohmann Hunt also uses the Orient excessively, but his purpose is different. His agenda is to illustrate the Bible stories and try to make them as authentic as possible. And so he ha goes for authentic clothes, authentic dress, all this um, fret work and everything else. This one that I just whizzed past is um, a genre scene, but it's obviously set in the streets in Cairo. He's been influenced by all the um, lithographs and paintings. And this young man who's in love with a girl can't see her face till he marries her. So that is the sort of pathos of it. Uh, it's also the modesty of it. So there's a slight message about modesty in this. But, you know, it wasn't only the paintings and lithographs and great folios of etchings. It was also the architecture. And this, of course, is the most stunning of all examples that I know of, the inside of Lord Leighton's wonderful house in Holland Park. And you can go there as open to public, obviously, you can go. And I believe this is a verse from the Quran. So everybody wanted these tiles and everybody wanted the exotic Orient in some form of another. And you will start to see it everywhere if you look not only architecture, but clothes. And if you manage to get the wasp waist, you might have to have a rib taken out. You could even dress up a Cleopatra, like this woman, Mrs. Paget, with a tiny weenie waist and headdress looking very soulful. And this one, very racy, you can actually see through the diaphanous skirt. So dressing up as, uh, as an Egyptian was very much the trend a la mode. And in Paris, it was not only Egyptian dress and Egyptian jewellery, but as I said, the influence of the giraffe, um, people wearing hats a la giraffe and capes a la giraffe and covering your chairs with giraffe patterned um, silk and all that kind of thing. But if you could dress up as an Egyptian and you were rather well connected, you might get invited to a mummy unrolling. Now, this is a genuine genuine invitation that I found. Uh, Monday on 10th of June, 1850, in at 140 Piccadilly, 44, you would invite to a mummy from Thebes was going to be unrolled at two o'clock, half past two in the afternoon. And you'd be invited. So you had to wear your Egyptian jewelry and your Egyptian clothes. And as the mummy was unrolled, if they found bits of jewelry, it would be, be given to different people in the room, the women, obviously. And when the corpse was finally, there's the case of the mummy there. When the corpse was finally revealed, the corpse would be walked around the room so you could shake hands with it. Now, there were very, very many mummies being unrolled in London and probably in Paris. And it wasn't even that, but in, because people were traveling I mean, now towards the middle and later on in the 19th century, the enterprising local Egyptians would hide mummies and bury them in critical places. And they would also hide and bury Egyptian artifacts, little figurines, anything they could find and steal from graves. They could move down to a, a better location and hide it and then take the tourists along. The tourists could find it. And wow, look, we're archaeologists. All of that was happening. But not only that, while you were busy digging up a mummy that somebody had hidden for you, you might have a dinner in the temple at Karnak. And, Sit up straight and put your napkin on your lap. And I'm thinking of Rosie. I hope she's listening. Napkin on lap, sit up straight. 
um, at this wonderful banquet that's happening. It's blurry, of course, because it's a very old camera. And not only that, but obviously, with any luck, you try and climb a pyramid, putting on your pith helmet and you are pushed up the pyramids. And I'm sure that my grandparents must have climbed the pyramids a lot. So, and I mean, when my grandpa, my grandmother knew um, Lawrence of Arabia very well, and my mother can remember meeting him in the souk. She couldn't understand why this very tall Arab that was pushing his way through the crowd had blue eyes very brown skin and blue eyes. He walked straight up to my grandmother and kissed her and said, hello, Con. Anyway, even better, of course, is a picnic on top of the pyramid in the lovely sun. Um, of course, you know, it's just a very, very, I mean, I don't know if anybody would ever dare to do it now, but this poor, poor old Egyptian would have to have carried the table and the rug up to the top of the pyramid. So that's really, I think, pretty much where we're going to Leave it. I just wanted to round out his life. A final look at one of his great paintings. When he was back in England, and the, the you know the lithographs was seeping out all over the all over the country, making him a household name, and giving people a glimpse of countries they places they would never be able to go to, never dare to go. Even men were it was dangerous to go. At the same time, he was making magnificent paintings like this. And again, the fabulous composition of a dramatic diagonal dividing the painting in half, uh, locked by this gateway here, which is reflected in the in the gateway here. This is feline, the island of feline, and the you know the kind of ochre, golden ochre, on the wall in perfect in perfect contrast to the octopus ink, blacky water down here. Magnificent painting, and I'm the first to say that David Roberts began with a simple ambition and, and did it studiously, but turned into a really magnificent artist. So he went on to glory. In 1840, he returned to England from his long journey in the East. In 1841, he was elected a full member of the Royal Academy. Ten years later, 1851, by the command of Queen Victoria, he made a painting of the opening of the Great Exhibition which of course was the great, um, the, the great, you know, the, the great um, thing of Prince Albert, and Prince Albert would have been a huge supporter of David Roberts. And also in 1851, he went off to Italy and made some paintings of the Doge's Palace, which were bought by Lord Londesborough, and another one presented the Scottish Academy. So he had works in the in the London Academy and in the Scottish Academy. And then in 1858, he was presented with the freedom of the city of Edinburgh, a great honour. And then sadly, on the 25th of November in 1864, he was painting St Paul's Cathedral from Ludgate Hill when he suddenly collapsed. And he died that night from a stroke. He's buried in West Norwood Cemetery, right next to his great lifelong friend and collaborator, Louis Haig. That is a story of a man who became a household name, who starting from very, from, from very simple origins with a very clear business plan, turned into a really fine artist and created our view of what we thought the Islamic world was like. Thank you very much, the end. Uh, get me out of the meeting, just hang up. <laughs>